Hey, what is up guys? It's Shannon from the Trinosphere where Timmy, Johnny, and Spike battle over all things EDH. And today I'm here to talk to you about Bruvac in this $100 deck list I'm calling Run of the Mill Petitioners. I've come to find that a lot of people online when they're doing streams tend to frown upon combo. They don't like it when the game's really starting to get going, really the board state's getting exciting and all of a sudden it ends. So this one is gonna be focused less on comboing and more grinding out wins with Mill, which I think is kind of bad in EDH and I'll tell you why in a second. But before I dive into the deck list, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. You want to get notifications when you, uh, more unique and rare combo lists by me, the Johnny, come out later, or perhaps beat down in win more lists by Timmy come out. And then there's also interactive competitive lists by Spike that'll be coming out too in the future as well, especially as we get into these new commander-centric sets coming up. All right, Bruvac the Grandiloquent. Grandiloquent is a three mana one four legendary human advisor that says if an opponent would mill one or more cards, they mill twice as many instead. And of course, mill is a replacement to put top card of library into graveyard. This is, I think, a acknowledgement from Watsi that mill is actually an underrated archetype in EDH, or an underpowered archetype in EDH. You would imagine that any archetype, as it's built for Magic the Gathering, uh, has to be built with all formats in mind. And one that, of course, is always on the forefront of Watsi sees mindset is limited. So if you if the card is balanced for a limited format in which you have one opponent with a 40 card deck, how can it possibly scale well into a format where you have three or four opponents that have 100 card decks? So I think Mill has always been, outside of going infinite in a combo, a pretty weak archetype in EDH. But I think finally Watsi's acknowledged that by printing us Bruvac as a response. Let's take all of those cards that are generally speaking not good in our format and double their power with our legendary creature to which we have access access all the time. So I think this is a pretty good card in this format and I'm excited to be building around it. Now of course, this deck is gonna be running a lot of Persistent Petitioners, 30 in fact. I usually run a little bit more when I can run Thrumming Stone, but of course Thrumming Stone's a bit out of our budget. So I'm running only 30 in this list. Persistent Petitioners is a two mana one three that has an activated ability to mill an opponent or a player for one, but also has a second activated ability that says you may tap four untapped advisors you control and then target player mills 12. What's unique about that is that the activated ability taps for untapped advisors regardless of whether or not they have summoning sickness. The last important thing about Persistent Petitioners is a deck can have any number of cards named Persistent Petitioner. So this is one of the few cards that can violate the Highlander rule, the there can be only one rule of EDH. And the other ones were being those black rats, the rat colony and the uh, relentless rats. So of course, when we get quadruples of persistent petitioners, groups of four, each one of those groups can mill an opponent for 12 cards per, or around one eighth of their library. Now with Bruvac in play, we double that power. Now uh, any group of four petitioners can mill an opponent for one fourth of their library. So this can quickly eliminate a player's, if we have multiple groups of persi persistent petitioners, or we can grind them out over the span of a few turns. Now, and one card that we will be running that's very often run with Persistent Petitioners is Sphinx of the Chimes. This six mana five six flyer says discard two non-land cards with the same name to draw four cards. Of course, our deck has a ton of Persistent Petitioners in them, so a lot of this deck is built around trying to improve the value of a Persistent Petitioner, uh, whether it be in our hand or in play. Now, Sphinx of the Chimes helps us improve the flood of Persistent Petitioners. If we draw too many of them, we can cash them in for removal spells or other effects. Some ways that we're gonna, we're gonna supercharge persistent petitioners by increasing their mill output is by untapping them. We're going to use Dramatic Reversal, Faces of the Past, and Mask of the Mimic. Dramatic Reversal needs no introduction. I, it's usually run with Isochron Scepter, which you can do. I'm not going to. So I'm just going to be running uh, Dramatic Reversal as a way, as a one-shot untap my petitioners. So if we can mill them for 24 when Bruvex in play, we can then cast Dramatic Reversal to mill them for another 24. So boom, we gotta, we got to traumatize them out of nowhere. We're also going to run Faces of the Past. Now, this is my budget Johnny replacement for my one of my favorite cards in Petitioners, which is Intruder Alarm. Intruder Alarm is insane in Persistent Petitioners. And I would recommend that if you can afford the $12 card that is Intruder Alarm, I would put it in here over Faces of the Past and maybe change a few other things. But right now I'm talking about my $100 list and this is my replacement for Intruder Alarm. This card says whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, you may tap or untap all creatures that share a card type with it. So whenever a human or an advisor dies, you can untap all humans and or advisors. In this regard, it makes attacking us very difficult when we have Petitioners in play because if we block with one Petitioner, we then untap all of our other Petitioners. So this makes it really hard to attack us 
which a lot of this deck is a little you know, political manipulation kind of thing. Mask of the Mimic also helps us feed into Faces of the Past. Now, we don't really get a control as well as Intruder Alarm how often Faces of the Past triggers. It's on our opponents to kind of stumble into it on accident. So we have a few cards in here that allow us to sacrifice our creatures for added benefit. Mask of the Mimic allows us to sacrifice any creature to search our library for a copy of target creature and put it into play. So sacrificing a creature to go get a Precision Petition or putting it into play. So that has added benefit of blinking a removal, or we can cash in a Solemn Similar Akram for another Persistent Petitioner, kind of like a, a weird polymorph effect. So another way to support Sphinx of the Chimes grinding people out with our card draw is Blue's milling bread and butter, in my opinion, and that is enchantments that mill when we draw cards. There's three of them that, I, that I'm going to mention here, Psychic Corrosion, Sphinx's Tutelage, and Teferi's Tutelage. Psychic Corrosion, I think, is one of recent additions to EDH that shows that Wizards of the Coast acknowledges that mill is a little weak, and that is, it's the first one that affects all of our opponents simultaneously. Almost all of the other ones will affect only target opponent or one player, but Psychic Corrosion says whenever we draw a card, each opponent mills too, which is great. So this is a standard by which to judge all of the other ones by. So let's judge Teferi's Tutelage based on that. Now Teferi's Tutelage, same mana cost, only mills one opponent for two cards, probably a little bit worse than Psychic Corrosion. However, Teferi's Tutelage does trigger a draw and discard when it enters the battlefield. You can kind of classify Psychic Corrosion as a do-nothing enchantment, and by that I mean you can tap three mana, cast Psychic Corrosion, and then pass the turn, and then your opponent on their turn casts Reclamation Stage for three mana, blows up Psychic Corrosion. Now, in that case, Psychic Corrosion did not do anything in that game. It did not affect the board at all. Whereas, opposed to the Fairy's Tutelage instead, would have at least milled somebody for two to four cards, depending on Bruvac's existence. And of course, this card is very useful in the early game to filter bad hands. You're able to, to if you get flooded with lands or petitioners, you can cash those out using the loot effect on Teferi's Tutelage. Now, Sphinx's Tutelage is probably the most powerful one of this. Once again, it only targets one opponent, so it's weaker than Psychic Corrosion in that regard. However, it has that grindstone clause added on that says if two of those cars are the same color, repeat this process. And I want to mention that Sphinx's Tutelage has been eroded for Bruvac, so you gotta you gotta believe that Wizards is trying to make Mill strong through Bruvac when they errata Sphinx's Tutelage to make it work. So Sphinx's Tutelage used to say both non-land cards are the same color, repeat this process. Now it says if two of those cards share a color, repeat this process. So the text with Bruvac in play would read something along the lines of whenever you draw a card, target opponent mills four cards, and if two or more of those cards share a color, repeat this process. So of course, this can absolutely shred a monocolor deck. They have to hit colorless cards in order to stop Sphinx's Tutelage from milling them out. So every time they get milled for four, they have to hope to God they get a three land set in there to stop the milling. And of course, this is off of one draw. So if you if you hit them with six of these draws in a row, they're, they're basically done. They're gonna mill their entire deck out. And that could be the case for two color decks and maybe even some three color decks that are really heavily focused on green or something like that. So I'm really excited for Sphinx's Tutelage with Bruvac and, I, and the errata I think is kind of insane. All right, let's talk about some of our other mill engines. We have Drown Secrets, Memory Erosion, and Thought Scour. Drown Secrets just adds a little bit of extra mill power to all the rest of our deck. It makes uh, Persistent Petitioners a little less worse when you can tack on that mill two to four cards whenever you cast them. Memory Erosion, it mills our opponents whenever they cast spells. Once again, I hate giving my opponents the ability to slow down the mill or to work around, the play around the mill. And they can pivot from casting a lot of small creatures to casting just one or two big creatures, but it's still a good enough card that when we have all these enchantments in play, it makes it really difficult for opponents to find the correct way through this milling minefield that we've created. And then Thought Scour is a great cantrip. This one mana draw card, target player mills two, or four with Bruvac in play. Uh, this is a good cantrip. It's also a little bit more affordable than Ponder and Preordain, which are the general go-tos. For our ramp removal and draw, we do have some ramp in here, despite the fact that we run 32 drops. Uh, we're gonna have Kefnet's Monument, Midnight Clock, Mindstone, and Solemn Simulacrum. Kefnet's Monument, of course, makes all of our blue creatures cost one less. So all those two drop petitioners now cost one, which is kind of bananas. It also helps some of our bigger creatures, which we'll talk about later, specifically our creatures that draw us cards when they enter the battlefield. But I wanna talk real quick about how this says whenever you cast a creature spell, target creature and opponent controls doesn't untap during the next untap step. So one of the control suites that we're gonna be running in here is more of a tap down control suite. We're gonna be able to slow the game down by freezing out big threats that could potentially kill us. And so this card helps uh, upgrade tapping them down to what I call freezing them. Not only are they tapped, but they don't untap next turn. Midnight Clock is a pretty cool mana rock. This three mana artifact taps for a blue and it has an ability to put our counters on it, but I really don't even ever do that. Well, I just want to talk about how at the beginning of each upkeep, we put an hour counter on Midnight Clock, and once the 12th hour counter is put on it, we uh, exile Midnight Clock, shuffle our hand and graveyard into our library, then draw seven. So this is a basically a way to refill our hand in the mid to late game, and it's one of the few blue effects out there that do this to shuffle the graveyard in hand and draw seven that don't do it to your opponents, because it's very important to not run any like time reversal or any of these other cards that would shuffle your opponent's graveyard.
graveyards back in their library. Of course, you don't want to do that. It's going to completely hose your strategy and undo all of your hard work. So I like this mana rock a lot. And when you're in a four player game, I should mention it says at the beginning of each upkeep, put an hour counter on me. So if you're in a four player game, you have three opponents, you cast midnight clock. By the time it reaches your turn again, it's now four o'clock. And then when it reaches your turn again, it's eight o'clock. And then on the on the end of the third turn, uh, it's already reached midnight and it's already popped and drawn you a fresh seven. So it can trigger pretty fast without having to put our counters on it. Mind Stone, I love my two mana mana rocks. And this one's great because it, of course, can be sacked to draw a card. A way to trigger our mill on draw enchantments. Similarly, Solemn Sinulacrum, when it dies, draws us a card. But it also gives us that extra land into play tapped, helping us ramp a little more because we do have a couple of big spells, despite the fact that we're a 33 land deck. For our targeted removal, I want to talk about Curse of the Swamp opposition and reality shift and I want to talk about reality shift and curse of the swine because when I run removal spells like this that replace a creature with another one I want to make sure my deck is well positioned against that creature for example I hate running swan song in my planeswalker decks because I hate giving my opponents a 2-2 flyer for free I don't want to get my planeswalkers hit by this flyer so I generally don't run swan song similarly this deck would be bad against generous gift and beast within giving them a 3-3 is tough when all you have is a 1-3 blocker on average so I love curse of the swine and reality shift because I love giving them two twos very easy to block with my my one threes and my one four Bruvac. Now opposition is feeding into that whole tap down control thing I was telling you about. This four mana enchantment says tap an untapped creature you control to tap target artifact creature or land. This is kind of bananas when you have tons and tons of extra petitioners laying around. You can then use them to tap down creatures bigger than themselves. You're threatened by a Blightsteel Colossus, just tap it down. You can use it to tap down lands. If they're playing a fancy pants expensive deck that has a Cabal Coffers, you can just tap that on their upkeep so they can't use that mana on their main phases. And of course you can use it to tap down other artifacts they're trying to combo off. So I think opposition is a really strong card in this list and it gets better with Kevnet's Monument which freezes them for an extra turn and then other cards that I'll talk about in a minute. But to feed more into that we're going to run also Tidal Force and Tide Spout Tyrant. Tidal Force is an 8 mana creature that says at the beginning of each upkeep you may tap or untap target permanent. So once again feeding into that tapping down the biggest problematic card on their board on their upkeeps. But also it can untap cards so if we have extra petitioners laying around but they don't quite mit in a second quadruple we can then untap a, one of those milling petitioners to make another 4 set and tap them again to mill another 24 cards. Tide Spout Tyrant is insane. I love this card. His 8 mana 5 5 flyer says whenever you cast a spell, return target permanent to its owner's hand. So we're talking about adding extra value to petitioners, making them better than just a 2 mana 1 3. This turns them into boomerangs. You won't be sad to draw a petitioner off the top when Tide Spout Tyrant's in play because you know that you can just bounce the biggest threat again on your opponent's boards. And of course, they have to recast that threat over and over and over again, and that triggers your memory erosion and whatnot. For our counter spells, we're going to be running Negate, Counter Spell, and my Johnny Pick Abjure. I don't need to talk about Negate and Counter Spell. You've probably heard about those a million times before. Abjure is a one mana counter spell, hard counter, but it requires you to sacrifice a blue permanent. So this is kind of like a swan song, but it can hit anything, but it requires you to sacrifice persistent petitioner to do so, which is really not that big of a deal because you're going to have a ton of them laying around. For our board wipes, we're going to run Washout and Whelming Wave. And it's important for me to run low CMC board wipes like these because I want to be able to immediately redeploy Bruvac and some petitioners if possible. I don't want to board wipe past a turn and then everyone deploys their huge armies again and then it's on my turn I deploy a couple of one threes I feel like I'm going to lose that game very quickly I'm also going to run Sentinel Totem this one mana artifact says when I ETB scry one and then you can use me to exile all graveyards so this is a, a way to hose graveyards if we're against a reanimator deck or maybe one of our guys one of our opponents is not playing a budget list and they have an Eldrazi Titan that can trigger to shuffle to undo all of our hard work and shuffle their graveyard back in we can be like nope trigger on the stack exile your graveyard get that crap out of here for our draw engines we have ever watching threshold to fairies ageless insight verity circle and witching well ever watching thresholds pretty bad card i generally don't like it but i think it works well in this deck in that it has added synergy with our mill on draw enchantments so now whenever they attack us not only do we draw a card but then they mill some number of cards depending on which ones we have in play and then also attacking us is kind of a pain in the butt because we're gonna have tons and tons and tons of extra bodies laying around so this just adds to this big pile of i don't know if i really want to waste an attack on the petitioner deck it doesn't feel like it's doing anything and it's actually hurting me so this really feeds into that as kind of a cheap propaganda to Fairy's Ageless Insight's insane in this deck. This four mana enchantment says if ever you draw a card except for the first one you draw on your on your draw step, draw two instead. So it increases the draw power of every card we've talked about so far, and then more that we're going to talk about in a second. Barity Circle feeds into that tap down control build. This three mana enchantment says whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it's not being declared an attacker, we may draw a card. So this works really well with opposition. It allows us to tap our persistent petitioners to tap down threatening creatures and draw a card doing so. It also triggers off of things like uh, mana dorks, 
effects or activated abilities that require their creatures to tap as well. So Verity Circle can result us in drawing a lot of cards, especially when opposition comes into play. It becomes insane, like they must deal with it immediately. Witching Well kind of feeds into the Teferi's Ageless Insight plan. This is a one mana artifact that says, when I enter the battlefield, scry two. And then later in the game, you can cash me in, paying four mana to draw two cards. So generally speaking, that rate is pretty bad. What I like to do is I like to leave this around until Teferi's Ageless Insight is in play. And then I cash that in for four cards instead of two. Similarly, we're gonna run for our burst draw, Chemistry's Insight, Gadwick the Wizened and Mass Appeal. And like I said about Witching Well, I love to leave Chemistry's Insight in the graveyard after using it early game and wait until Teferi's Aegis Insight is in play. So now it becomes four mana draw for it instant speed, which I like a lot. Gadwick the Wizened is that one creature I was telling about with Kevnet's Monument. Helps us draw extra cards when it's discounted. Gadwick has a second ability, in addition to being a living mind spring, drawing us X cards when we, when we cast it. It also says, whenever you cast a blue spell, tap target non-land permanent opponent controls. So once again, it's another tap down uh, control effect, triggering Verity Circle, and then setting up Kefnet's Monument to hose them and lock that creature out of the game for an extra turn. Mass Appeal, usually running in Persistent Petitioner's decks. This one is a three mana draw card for each human you control. So if you have four Petitioners and a Bruvac in play, that's draw five for three mana, which is pretty good. And then of course, Fairy's Aegis Insight bumps it, doubles it, so it can be used in a late game. Even if you're board wiped, you can be like, all right, I'm gonna cast two Petitioners and then Mass Appeal for four cards. We're also gonna run Metamized Prophecy, Opt, and Perilous Research. Metamized Prophecy, another one of those cards which we want to kind of play into our Teferi's Aegis Insight. We want to make that sure that's in play by the time we reach chapter three so we can draw four cards instead of two. But otherwise, I like these early game cards that scry and help us fix our bad hands early game because it's easy to get too many petitioners, too few lands in the early game. We want to have these scry effects to help us smooth that out. And then of course, we can use those later in the game for Teferi's Aegis Insight if we can time Metamized Prophecy correctly. Opt, another good cantrip and Perilous Research feeding into that Faces of the Past card, allowing us to sacrifice either a Persistent Petitioner, a Psalm Similar Akram, or in late game, I often use uh, just sacrifice an island to Perilous Research to draw two cards, or four of Teferi's Aegis Insight is in play. All right, that covers all of our spells. So let me quickly talk about our lands. We're only gonna run 33, which is very low, but the average CMC of our deck is also very low. Generally speaking, it's two CMC. But we're also gonna have some cool spell lands. We're gonna run Castle Vantress, which for four mana and tap, we can scry two. Just slightly better than an island, and helps us if we were basically top decking late game to make sure we don't accidentally just keep top decking petitioners. We're also gonna run Ghost Quarters, Ipnu Rivulet, and Scavenger Grounds. So these uh, help us uh, deal with problematic lands, hose people's graveyards, or also Ibni Rivulet can, can sack a desert to mill somebody for four or eight when Bruvac's in play. We're also going to run Remote Isle and Lonely Sandbar, two cards uh, cycling blue lands so that we can trigger mill on draw enchantments via lands. All right, that wraps up this $100 Bruvac list. Let me know what you think, and let me know if there's other commanders you'd like to see me work on, whether it be as a Johnny trying to go infinite with some bad cards and cheap takes, or, you know, if you want to see some Timmier or spikier builds, let me know as well. All right, guys, that's a wrap for this week. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon if you want to see more deck techs by the Trinosphere. Great minds, brew alike.